Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this week's uh, Durham Geometry and Topology Seminar. So our speaker this week is uh, Georg Frank uh, from uh, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, the Institute of Algebra and Geometry. And he will talk about the space of positively uh, curved, uh, of Riemannian metrics with positive Ricci curvature. Yes. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, the introduction and for the invitation actually. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the space of positive Ricci curvature metrics today. And this project is joint work with Jens Reinhold from Münster. Uh, let me start by introducing the notation I will use throughout this talk. So yeah, whenever I say M, this will mean a spin manifold and the dimension will be usually abbreviated by D and will be high down, it will be very high. So D will be at least six. And this R rich greater zero of M will denote the space of those Riemannian metrics but such that the Ricci curvature is stricter, strictly, like, strictly greater than zero everywhere. Okay. And yeah, in recent years, a lot of activity has been around these spaces of metrics and curvature bounds. And usually there are like two questions Around. So the first question, of course, is uh, the question if M does actually admit a metric satisfying a given condition, in this case, positive Ricci curvature. And the second question is if it does well, what does the space look like? So if you will, this is kind of like an existence and uniqueness question. So um, I mean, saying that it's the Ricci curvature is positive is like an open condition. So it won't be uniqueness in the sense that there is only one metric, but you can still ask for uh, uniqueness up to homotopy. You can ask for different path components and then about higher homotopy groups of this space, are they all trivial and so on. And so what I mean by what does it look like? I don't mean the precise point set homotopy structures, but uh, topological structures, but rather homotopy invariants. So things like homotopy groups, and homology and cohomology groups. And well, something that's been uh, researched also in recent years is uh, multiplicative structures on these spaces. And so today I will talk mostly about homotopy and cohomology groups. And so let me give a bit of a state of the art overview because this is going to be very quick since almost nothing is known. So what's known? Um, this is a result from this year due to Manuel Kranich Sander Coopers and Oscar Randall Williams, who showed that if you consider the diffeomorphism group of HP2, so the quaternionic projective plane, um, and you fix one metric with positive Ricci curvature, then you can say you get the orbit map induced by the action, by the pullback action or by the push forward action. And this induces a map from the diffeomorphism space to uh, the space of metrics. And what they showed is if you look at this map under pi three and you only care about elements of infinite order, then this map is surjective. So you find an element of infinite order in this homotopy group. This is what it's saying. And you even can say it comes from a family of diffeomorphisms acting on one particular metric. So that's one result. And in order to state the other known result about the higher homotopy type of the space, I need to introduce the notion of a genus of a manifold. And this is a generalization of the genus of a surface. So what does that mean? So let M be a manifold of dimension 2N. And let G of M be the maximum natural number such that M decomposes into some manifold, connect some with a G fold, connect some of Sn times Sn. So if you consider for a moment the case D equal to N, this precisely tells you that you can split all uh, that you can cut off G tori. So this recovers precisely the genus of the surface. And of course you can define a similar thing for odd dimensional manifolds, but then you don't cut off Sn times Sn, but Sn times Sn plus one. Okay, and now that I have this available, I can name the other result, which is due to Boris Budwinik, Johannes Ebert, and David Ray. 
And what they showed is that the rational cohomology ring of this space is non-trivial. And the kind of drawback of their result is that there are conditions when this holds. And the conditions are that it doesn't hold for all dimensions. So this is exclusive to dimensions congruent 0, 2, and 4 mod 8. It doesn't hold for all manifolds, but it requires the genus to be very large. So depending on the uh, residue class of the dimension, this is, the genus has to be at least 13, 17, or 21. And it only holds for some k in the first seven. So one can be a bit more precise, again, depending on the dimension, but it's still not that you can precisely say one group does not vanish, but it's still in a range. And so what I will talk about today is how to upgrade the second result. And I mean, the obvious questions are if these three assumptions down here can be dropped or at least weakened. So I want to talk about an extension to other dimensions, to smaller genus, and to maybe some more precise estimates in K. Okay, and now without further ado, here's the main result of our project. So let D be at least 10. So um, D is the dimension of the manifold and let D not be 13. M as in the introduction is a spin manifold and the genus of M has to be at least one. So M is some other manifold connects some with SN times SN or SN times SN plus one, depending on the dimension. And the result is that then the rational cohomology of the space does not vanish for some of the first 9k. And yeah, let's do the checking. Okay, so there's no restriction on the residue class modular eight of the dimension, that's good. There is uh, the genus bound is very low, that's also good, but it looks like the estimate on k is worse, but it turns out we actually can be more precise on k. And namely, we can say that, uh, again, depending on the dimension, k is in one of two uh, numbers if the dimension is even and one out of three numbers if it's odd. Okay, and maybe let me take a second to point out that this is a statement about cohomology, but you can easily uh, translate it into a statement about homotopy groups by applying the Horevich theorem. So this actually tells you that there is some non-trivial non loops or some non-trivial sphere inside this space. Okay, now this dimension exclusion is a bit sad. And it turns out that in this dimension and actually in all dimensions congruent five and six mod eight, starting in dimension six, we can say something more. So let D be at least six, and let's be in one of those two cases, which includes 13. And again, the genus has to be at least one. Then one of the following statements is true. Either this inclusion map from positive Ricci curvature metrics to positive scalar curvature metrics collapses infinitely many components to one, or the rational cohomology of this space is non-vanishing or one of the first two degrees. And if the dimension is even, so if we are in dimension six mod eight, we can even say precisely that the first cohomology vanishes then. Okay, so let me start by, now that we have these results, let me start by explaining how the principle, how this detection principle works, how we can, uh, find these non-trivial elements. And so the principle states about, let's assume we are given a stably parallelizable manifold E. So this means uh, a manifold such that the tangent bundle is 
stably trivial. So you add trivial directions to the tenant bundle and it becomes a trivial bundle. Uh, so examples for these are spheres or products of spheres. And second thing we are we want is a bundle over B, which is a bundle with typical fiber M, so an M bundle. Such that. So first property this bundle should have is that the head genus of the bundle vanishes. Does it does not vanish, sorry. And the second property is that E admits a spin structure. Okay, so this is purely topological. And there is one more condition, and in order to state this, well, uh, let's consider. So, so this bundle comes with some extras, namely, it comes with a classifying map. So, it comes with a map to B diff of M. where B diff of M is the classifying space for M bundles. And if I now look at this map through the homotopy group glasses, I get an induced map from, map from pi one of B to pi one of B diff of M. And uh, the way the classifying space works is that pi one of B of something is precisely pi zero of something. So this is isomorphic with two pi zero of the diffeomorphism group. And this acts on the space of metrics and in particular on the space of the Ritchie curvature metrics. And so now that I have this, I can write down the third condition that this bundle should satisfy this action pi one B on the components of the space show a factor through a finite group. Okay. So these are the assumptions. And the conclusion then is that if I have a bundle like this, then there is some integer k between two and the dimension of B such that two things hold. First, the cohomology of B in some degree does not vanish. And secondly, the same is true for the cohomology of the space I'm interested in. And so whenever I write cohomology, I mean with rational coefficients. And so the way this works is that usually we know what B is and we know where the cohomology of B lives. So that this is not something we conclude, but this is some input we get on uh, so that we can be more precise on this k index, meaning that we can be more precise on the k over here. Okay. And so the upshot of this is that one needs to construct bundles like this. Okay, and this is precisely what the main like ingredient in our paper was, in our project. And so this main ingredient reads as follows, that I, G, uh, I, J, P, and Q be natural numbers satisfying some qualities which are much harder to decipher than they look. And trust me, I tried for a long time, but 
let's just say, say there are some restrictions. Then there is a bundle with fiber SP times SQ over again a product of spheres, so S for I minus P times S for J minus Q, which has a spin structure on the total space, an embedded trivial disk bundle, and non-vanishing A hat genus. So the A hat genus is my first condition over here. The spin structure is the second condition, so that's kind of clear where those come from. And the embedded trivial disk bundle is necessary to like move on from this product of spheres as p times sq to other manifolds. So once I have this embedded trivial disk bundle, I can just say I do fiber connect some with some manifold and that's how I get to uh, manifolds with, with genus at least one from this proposition. Okay, so how does the proof of this proposition work? And for notation reasons, uh, I will only do the proof for j equal to i and p equal to q equal to 4 i minus 1. And I will sometimes also call this n for, yeah reasons that are hard to explain and probably only exist in my mind. But now how's the strategy for constructing these bundles? Well, the strategy is to start not with the full uh, as n times as n or as p times as q, but with a subset, namely with the following. So I take s n times s n and I cut out a disk. And the advantage now is that I can decompose this into Sn times Dn, the union Dn times Sn. And this union is over Dn times Dn. So I think this is an appropriate point to show some picture. And so this is the one vector. This is Sn times Dn. Then I have dn as a hemisphere sitting or as a subdisk sitting in the sphere. And then I take the sphere in the opposite vector and just glue them on here. And so, yeah. And this dn times dn area is what sits in the middle, which is where the identifying happens. And yeah, if you are uh, more comfortable seeing it this way, this is like the plumbing of two trivial disk bundles over the sphere. Okay, so this is the manifold I start with. And one more input I need is a map or an element in the homotopy groups pi for i minus one of SO for i minus one, which is isomorphic to the integers. And I don't just want to pick one, but I want to pick an element such that the Pontryagin class corresponding to alpha, which I'm, by which I mean the Pontryagin class of the bundle. So this is the vector bundle. Clutched by alpha. So this is a run rank for I vector bundle. So I can associate some Pontryagin class to that. And I want this to be non-vanishing. And yeah, once I have this, I get, I can define my diffeomorphisms. Namely that F be a diffeomorphism of the first part of this, so as n times dn to itself and g of the other part, the n times Sn to itself. And these are defined by f of x, y should be doing nothing in the first on the sphere coordinate. And then while alpha is a map from precisely the sphere into the special orthogonal group. So this is a family of matrices and that just can uh, multiply this at any point 
with my element from the disk. And for G, I do the same thing. But since the sphere now sits in a second coordinate, this becomes alpha of y times x comma y. Okay. So one needs to be a bit careful about this being really different morphisms. But if one chooses alpha or where one perturbs alpha by some homotopy, one can surely assume that. And so these are can actually be assumed to, to be smooth. And we can assume something more. Namely, we can assume that f restricted to the disk times the disk, so dn times dn, which is this middle part in here, is the same as g, g restricted to dn times dn is equal to the identity. So why can we assume that? Well, alpha was uh, a, a, yeah, an element in the homotopy group. So in particular, alpha of one is given by the identity or the base point over here. And I can just uh, apply some homotopy to uh, make alpha fix even a neighborhood of uh, the one in the sphere so that, uh, yeah, alpha is the identity if I apply some element to of, of the disk inside the sphere to, uh, to alpha. So this is just by some homotopy. And now that I have, I have some map on these, like the cylinder, which is the identity on here. So I can just extend this by the identity on the entire thing. So I can extend F and G to the entire M prime which was this whole manifold by the identity. And so what I get is an M prime bundle over S1 times S1, which essentially is, so this is S1, that's just one. So did I say times I said, wanted to say the, uh, yeah identifying one point of each. And essentially this works like taking the trivial M prime bundle and identifying by F here and by G here. But I actually don't want an M prime bundle over this wedge product, but I want a bundle over the actual product. So I have to look at the two sum of this bundle. In particular, I have to look at the attaching map of the two cell of S1 times S1. And of course, this is given by AB, A inverse, B inverse, where A is this uh, loop and B is this loop. And so the bundle restricted to, uh, to this gluing map, to this attaching map, is the trivial bundle because f and g commute, which is one observation. So f and g commute. Now, why do they do this? Well, because uh, we defined them so that they have different uh, disjoint supports. So whenever f does something non-trivially, then g is the identity because we extend it by the identity and f and g live on the opposite factor. So, so one lives over here, one lives over here. So they commute. And since the attaching map is precisely a commutator, this tells us that this M prime bundle extends to the two cell. And I get an M prime bundle over the torus, it's one times this one. Let me just give it a name. Let's call this E prime. So this is good, but this is not quite what we wanted because this still has a boundary. So this is not 
the file not quite the bundle we want to get, we want to close this off. So let's look at the boundary of this bundle. What is the boundary of E prime? That's a disk bundle, a sphere bundle, sorry. That's 2n minus one bundle over S one times S one. And we want to glue something in there. And it turns out we can do this, which is the first lemma I want to black box, which states that in the case that I'm in here, so where B is this product of two spheres, which is the torus, then there is some non-zero degree map of the torus, which uh, such that if I just change this classifying map, if I take the pullback along this non-zero degree map, then uh, this bundle on the boundary can be closed. And taking this, uh, taking this non-zero, uh, pulling back by, via this non-zero degree map has simply the effect of replacing F by F to the K and G by G to the K. And so this basically doesn't change any of the properties we will have later on. So it just amounts to picking a different alpha in the end, if you will. Again, the alpha corresponding to the class K times PI and she started with. So that's not an issue. And therefore, this tells us that there actually is an M bundle over S1 times S1. And I'm gonna introduce the, uh, this N before. So what M was, well, what it tells you is that there is an SN times SN bundle over S1 times S1, which is good. So what's left to be checked? Well, let me start with this embedded trivial disk bundle because this comes for free since the diffeomorphisms are given by the identity on this embedded disk, the N times, times the N. So this, the bundle uh, consisting of this this dn times dn is already trivial. And the bundle over the two cell is also trivial. So that's also not an issue. And then I glue in something somewhere else. This also doesn't change this. So this embedded trivial disk bundle comes for free, which is nice. So we only need to care about the A hat genus and the spin structures. OK, so let's start with the A hat genus. And by construction, and this is meant to be a bit vague, so this is not precisely true, but this is the intuition behind this. So the i contriagin class of my bundle E, or of the total space of E, is roughly the same as the Pontryagin class of alpha, which was assumed to be non-vanishing. So this, is, this gives you one non-trivial Contriagin number. So if you evaluate it against the fundamental class, then there's possibly something else, which is non-zero, which is the top thing. But for degree reasons, every other um, non every other possible contrary eigenclass or elementary contrary eigenclass vanishes. So all other elementary contrary eigen numbers vanish. And now some, now multiple, now some computation in multiplicative polynomials um, shows that this condition is enough to make the A hat genus non zero. Oh, and I forgot something, I forgot to say something that, which is also an input, which is that the signature vanishes because it's a bundle. I mean, E is a bundle over the torus, but in particular, it's a bundle over the circle, and uh, the signature of every uh, circle, every bundle over the circle vanishes. 
So, so question, yeah. uh, well, what do you mean by elementary contracting number? Uh, um, this means, okay, so this means that it's uh, a monomial. So, I mean, you can still add up these things with different coefficients. So that's, will give you something possibly non-trivial, but um, everything which only consists of PI times something as a monomial vanishes. And that's for degree reasons, because there is not enough cohomology in this space and this, yeah, in this space D. Okay, thanks. Okay, and so now this lemma says that if, uh, so let me check. So I have this one non-trivial Ponteriagin number, which is pi squared. And I possibly have p2i, which is i plus j also. So this is a typo over here, I'm sorry. Uh, also is non-trivial, possibly. And all other elementary Ponteriagin numbers and the signature vanish. Then this lemma tells me that the a hat genus does not vanish. And so this is precisely applicable to the case here, which is like the second condition we verified. And the third, also I would like to black box this, is uh, the uh, existence of a spin structure. And there's the lemma if I have an M bundle, which is such that the fiber is two connected, and there is an embedded trivial disk bundle, which I have nicely here. Uh, then this bundle admits a spin structure. So this says that P is spin, and this finishes the proof of the lemma. Okay, so now that we have this, let's look at how this solves or how this proves our main results. And in order to explain this, let me maybe go back to these, to the principle we are employing. So how does this work? Well, first of all, we are in the case that in the, in the case of this proposition that P and Q are both given by N or respectively in P equal N and Q equal N plus one, uh, because we want, this is the condition that the genus is at least one. So we have something like this embedded in there. And let me do an example case. So let's look at, for example, the case that uh, the manifold is of dimension congruent 2 mod 8, which means that n is something like 4n plus 1. And then the proposition tells us that there is a bundle as n times as n bundle over s3 times s3. And I checked the indices about a thousand times, and I'm still not sure if I got it right. So I invite you to check it and to correct me. And yeah. I hope you won't correct me, but if so, I will acknowledge that. Um, okay, so I got this bundle. Let's check the three requirements. So the aheadiness does not vanish and the spin structure is there. Okay, that's good. So this is given by the lemma. So I need to care about this action, but this comes with three actually, because the, the base space B doesn't actually have a fundamental group, it's simply connected. So this is even easier to check in this case. And so what this tells me is that there's some K between two and six, so that's the dimension here, such that the cohomology of B does not vanish for six minus K. So this means that K doesn't really have a choice other, to, uh, other than being three or six. And this says that H2 or H5, uh, a two or H5 of this space don't vanish. And yeah, so this is the proof for this case. And the other cases are 
similar by just done by just writing down the bundles. And well, one has to be a bit careful that all the exponents of the sphere are at least two so that we don't really don't need to think about this third requirement of the bundle. And again, I will happy to, I'll, I'll be happy to admit I'm wrong, but I hope I didn't screw the indices up. Okay, so that's it for this theorem. So then let's look at the other one because the proof is slightly different. And so this is dimensions five and six, not eight. And let me only do this six, dimension six, not eight, because the other thing again is completely analogous. And so what do I have in this case? Again, checking with the, with the proposition above, I get a bundle, this time over the torus. So this is precisely the one I uh, explained, or this, which I can, the one I constructed before. And so problem is now I have this fundamental group over here, which actually is now a non-trivial condition. But the point is this condition, uh, there's, it's kind of hard to verify this condition, but the point is that the, uh, the statement of the condition actually is interesting already. So it now works by not trying to prove this assumption, but just to make the case distinction. And the first case, of course, is, well, it doesn't actually work. So in this case, this action does not factor through a finite group. And in which case there exists a diffeomorphism of Sn times Sn of infinite order. So I can apply it again and again. I never reach the identity again, such that if I take some multiple sum exponent to uh, F to some exponent and then pull back some metric, some path component, uh, then this gives me an infinite family of components simply because I assume that the action does not factor through a finite group. And maybe uh, let me say that this maybe not is not true for all G, but at least for one G it's true. For one metric positive curvature, curvature, this is, curvature, this is true by case assumption. And it turns out for positive scalar curvature, it's actually known that this action is trivial. So this is some non-trivial input but this is known since for positive scalar curvature, it's easier to compute stuff like this and to draw conclusions like this. And so this family, every element of this family gets mapped to the same component by uh, include the space of Ritchie positive metrics into scalar positive metrics. And this means that this infinite family of components gets collapsed to one, which is precisely statement one. So in this case, we get uh, statement one of this theorem. And well, so the other case is that it does actually factor through a finite group, in which case the, the, this detection principle tells us that while well, there's some k in the in between two and two, so it has to be two, uh, meaning that h1 of the first cohomology of this group because after of this space does not vanish. And yeah, as I said, for the other dimension, the, K, the argument is completely analogous. The only thing you have to change is that you have as n times as n plus one and as one times as two over here, which then means that you, everything goes through as before, except you lose this exponent of two. And this one could be either one or two because the mention of the base is then three, so k is two or three. Okay. So let me use the remaining 10 to 15 minutes to explain how this principle is proven. So, and maybe to make a few observations about the proof. 
Okay, so um, so this bundle pi from E to B, this comes with a classifying map, and of course it comes with an underlying. Uh, diff of M bundle. Which I will denote by Q. So this is the bundle with the same uh, with the same structure group diff of M. And if I take the Borel construction, if I replace the fibers of this Q by the space M, I simply recover the, uh, the bundle E. But I can also do the Borel construction with some other space, since the different morphisms act on the space of positive Ricci curvature matrix. So I can replace the fibers of Q by the space of positive Ricci curvature matrix. And again, this is a bundle over B. And I will do my best to you note this by big pi and distinguish big pi over here from small pi over here. Yeah, let's hope this works. And um, okay, so this is something we have. Now we have this a head genus condition. Uh, let me translate this a little. So I have that the a head genus is not vanishing. So depending on who you ask, the ahead genus has different meanings, but I think the easiest way to write it down is to say that it is some polynomial in Pontryagin classes. So there's the ahead polynomial, which is some polynomial like this. And I evaluate against the fundamental class of E. Okay. And so once I have a cohomology class, I can form the associated kappa class. And okay, so this is defined by pi lower shriek of the class itself of the A hat class. And this pi shriek is the Gusin map. And in the context of manifolds, it's actually rather easy to write that down and to make that explicit by using Poincare duality. So I have HK of E. By Poincare duality, this is isomorphic to HK of DIN E minus K, also cohomology, from cohomology to homology. Then I can take the induced map from coming from the bundle pi. So this, the degree stays the same here. So and this goes to B, All right? This is an isomorphism and Poincare duality. And I can again apply Poincare duality. Again, this is an isomorphism, but the problem is this time it's uh, the dimension has changed. And so this doesn't land an HK, but an HK minus dim of E plus, or let me write like this, minus dim of E. Okay. And this is precisely the definition. And of course, the dimension of E minus the dimension of B is just the dimension of M, since this is a fiber bundle. And so this kappa class is an element in the cohomology, which degree it's the a hat class lives in a top degree. Uh, so this lives in the degree dim and dimension of B, the cohomology of B, and I will also 
abbreviate this by n. And okay, so I have this class and the point is now if the head genus is non-zero, then also this class is non-zero. So okay, why why do I do this? What what does this get me? Well, the point is this a hat, this kappa a hat class is accessible through index theory. And from there on, it's possible to draw conclusions about spaces of metrics. So let me make this precise. I have my bundle B to be here. And I have the bundle big pi here. For time reasons, let me abbreviate the space by X. And of course I can pull back the bundle E uh, to the space X along big pi. And so I have my kappa class, kappa of the head class over here. And this pulls back to pi star kappa of the head class here. And now this is what can be computed by the Atias in a index theorem. This is precisely given by the churn character applied after complexification. So this is the complexification map. Applied to the pullback along pi star, along pi of the family index of this bundle. And now what's the use of this? Well, the point is that uh, this index is related to positive scalar curvature. And it turns out that this bundle over here admits a fiber-wise metric of positive Ricci curvature. And in particular, because well, the base space essentially is given by some point in B and some Riemannian metric with positive Ricci curvature. So over each point, I have the typical fiber M because this is a pullback, so I have my fiber M. And so I can just take the metric which I have given on the base to the fiber. So I have a kind of canonical metric of positive Ricci curvature and in particular of positive scalar curvature. And this implies that the family index uh, vanishes when I pull this back to this bundle. And this implies in particular that this kappa class of E is a non-trivial class in the kernel of pi star. Okay, and from here on, the strategy is look at the SAS spectral sequence. For the vibration pi or the fiber bundle pi. And if you look at it for long enough, you find that there is some non zero differential, and you find, and this implies that the on the E2 page, there is some non trivial entry. And the E2, E2 page of the SAS spectral sequence is precisely given by. Hm minus k of e with coefficients, which is the base with coefficients in the fiber, which is the cohomology of the space I'm interested in. 
And so the overall message is this space is non-trivial. So both this space and well, both this group, this cohomology, and this cohomology group cannot vanish. And so this applies the claim and finishes the proof. And one final observation is that while actually I never really used that there is positive Ricci curvature, I only used that there is some fiber-wise metric on this bundle, which, uh, which can be thought of or can be deformed into a metric, fiber-wise metric of positive scalar curvature. And so this is like the reason for giving this proof is that actually an observation is that this entire thing, the entire thing I talked about today is not only true for positive Ricci curvature, but actually for every diffeomorphism invariant subset of positive scalar curvature. And if, if, uh, by some Ricci flow argument, it's uh, also true for diffeomorphism invariant subsets of the space of non-negative uh, scalar curvature, provided that the manifold I'm looking at is not Ricci flat. So in particular, assuming that it's not Ricci flat, the same result also holds for non-negative sectional and non-negative Ricci curvature. And yeah, so this is the final observation I wanted to mention. And yeah, thank you for your attention.